Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for July 22nd, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Ansel, Enhancing Privacy for Ubiquitous Computing with Use-Based Policy with Jason Waterman. Jason is an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Vassar College. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. And you just click on the chat icon and a little window will pop up. And we have a planned time at the end of the presentation to take questions as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jason. Jason, welcome. Great, thank you. All right, let me uh, share my screen here. Great. Um, can everyone see that? Yep, you look good. Fantastic. Great. Uh, it's great to be here today to talk about Ansile, our framework for developing privacy-aware, ubiquitous computing applications. Um, I'm Jason Waterman from Vassar College. I'll be giving you an overview uh, of our system today, uh, but this project is truly a team effort. From Cornell Tech, we have Eugene, who is a PhD candidate and is being supervised by Deborah. At Cornell University, we have Nate and Fred, who oversee the project, and Eleanor at P Pomona College recently received her PhD uh, with Fred acting as her advisor, and Griffin, uh, is my student who graduated from Vassar in May, and I'm proud to say he will be starting his PhD at Cornell University this fall. <clears throat> so the recent uh, proliferation of sensors have created an environment where our behaviors are just, are being continuously monitored and recorded. And that data is very personal <clears throat> to us. For example, fine-grained location data is being generated wherever we carry a phone, uh, for example, Google Takeouts, a service that lets you download your data collected by Google, shows a staggering number of things that they collect about you. And this is just one of the many service providers that we interact with on a daily basis. And they collect that data because it's, it's valuable. It doesn't take too much internet searching to find numerous examples of where companies arguably have crossed the line with regards to social norms. AccuWeather, a weather application which uses your location to show you the weather in your area, which makes sense, um, collects your location data and sells it to third-party advertisers, even when you're not using the application. And making headlines from just a few days ago, FaceApp, an application where you upload a picture of yourself and it shows you an aged version of yourself or there's other sorted transformations um, that you can do, it kind of, it went viral. Um, but if you look at the terms of service, um, it raises some privacy concerns about what they do with your image once you've uploaded it. And the larger concern here is that even if they're kind of acting on the up and up with, with, our, with our image data, we really have no way of knowing exactly <clears throat> what they're doing with, that, with their images. But, you know, for many reasons, we, there are many reasons why we want to share our data. Health and wellness applications can nudge us into making healthier life choices and recommender and prediction systems can help us decide what to listen to or watch, you know, on a Friday night. And, <clears throat> you know, aside from our personal data, when we put <clears throat> data collect, you know, being collected at, at scale, it can lead to um, solving an array of space management and sharing needs. Uh, the, image on the, <clears throat> the images on the right show one example of data-driven planning. Um, this is the Bike Angels program, which uses real-time tracking of city share bikes to build models that reward users who move bikes from more congested areas, as you kind of see in the uh, image on the, the lower uh, left-hand image, um, where they move them to congestion areas to le uh, less congested ones. So this saves the trouble and expense of manually moving uh, these <coughs> city share bikes with either trucks or you can see a picture in the, uh, on the top right of these tricycles that, you know, manually move them. So <clears throat> it's clear that the, the data 
it's useful for a wide range of applications, but there's clearly this tension between an application's desire for rich data and a person's willingness to trust that application with their data. And so I, will, I argue that it requires a system architecture and a framework that supports policies, privacy policies, as first class primitives. And our system, Ansile, is a framework that provides this uh, support. <clears throat> So Ansile supports the development of privacy-preserving data-rich applications. Um, to see how this is done, <clears throat> I'd like to answer kind of three questions. First, what is privacy? How can we represent privacy in our system? And finally, how can we enforce it? So first, what's privacy? There's lots of ways to define it, but we'll go with the following definition. Um, privacy is the restriction of information flows to only appropriate contexts and forms. Take Google Street View, for example. Am I comfortable with, <clears throat> with a Google Street View car taking a picture of my house once a year to improve Google's Maps? Sure, why not? That sounds like a good cause. However, um, would I be comfortable with that same car parking outside of my house, streaming a video feed of my house to YouTube? Absolutely not. And so context here really matters. And um, our definition is, you know, that my privacy is pr uh, preserved when I can express what's appropriate or not and have those restrictions enforced. So how do we represent privacy? Uh, one model that can help us is use-based privacy, where <clears throat> we define where acceptable actions depend on the context surrounding the data and the intended use of that data. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> use-based privacy uh, models are reactive, and the state of what is allowed depends not only on the data itself, but the history of the actions on that data. The current state of the policy determines what actions are acceptable, um, and let's take a look at an example of uh, use-based privacy. <clears throat> For this example, we have a policy on location data. And for this policy, I'm okay sharing my location if I'm on campus, but I'm not exactly comfortable sharing my exact location. So before I would like to share, before I'd like to share my application, I'd like some noise added to my location to fuzz it to a region of uncertainty of about 100 meters. Okay, this should give people enough detail um, to know which building I'm in on campus, but not at the office level detail. <clears throat> so this example shows that my permitted use depends on context, whether I'm on campus or not, and it shows that restrictions on data change based on transformations of that data. In, in, my, in this case, I will allow my fuzz data to be shared. Um, so these set of possible use authorizations forms uh, a finite state automaton, and the state of this privacy information changes when events, either environmental events or transformation events occur. <clears throat> so formally in our system, policies are specified as regular expressions over an alphabet of commands. These commands operate on data and the regular expression specifies how, how a data value may be used. Our policy language supports uh, the normal standard operations on uh, regular expressions, and I've shown them in the upper right corner. Uh, and the state transition diagram shows <clears throat> our example that I described on the previous slide. And uh, on the bottom is that state transition diagram uh, represented as a regular expression. The command that comes after the on campus, the underscore test true, uh, this is an internal Ansile command that's used to support policy branches. branches uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. <clears throat> so we can evaluate a, uh, the policy regular expression to see if a given command is authorized or not. Formally, for command C, a policy P authorizes that command if, there's, if there exists a string S with the prefix of C such that the string is in the set of strings uh, generated by the regular expression P. In other words, if our command is a valid prefix in the set of strings that that policy can generate, we will authorize that command. If that command is authorized, then we're going to advance that policy by taking the derivative. 
Uh, in our example, P sub X is the policy at the start. The command C, uh, fetch location, is authorized because it's a valid prefix of P sub X. Uh, our system will check and then um, when it's authorized, we'll execute the fetch location command. And the new policy is going to be the derivative. <clears throat> for, for this example, um, it's going to be P sub X with the prefix fetch location removed from there. Okay, so kind of where, where are we so far? So we've described policy, uh, excuse me, uh, we've uh, described privacy as the restriction of information to only appropriate contexts and forms. And we've seen that we can represent policies as regular expressions over an alphabet of commands. So now I'd like to describe our system and style, our system that allows for this policy enforcement. <clears throat> Antile is a runtime monitor um, positioned between an application and a user sensitive data. And the goal of Antile is to enforce a privacy policy. We get the name uh, Antile from, uh, because in ancient Rome, uh, an Antile was a sacred shield. <clears throat> the legend is, is that they were a set of these 12 shields, and one of these shields <clears throat> fell from heaven. It was seen as a token guarding the Roman Empire. So in this way, we view our system as a shield protecting the privacy uh, of a user's data. Before we describe Ansile uh, in detail, I'd like to talk about the three main entities that interact with Ansile, data providers, Ansile users, and applications. <clears throat> data providers are external entities to our system. Uh, they collect and store data on behalf of the user. We also assume that users are able to delegate data access authority to Ansile through a mechanism such as OAuth2. Um, for, these, uh, for, for the examples I'll talk about today, I focus on location data uh, because I think that's a good proxy for the challenges that arrive in uh, ubiqu ubiquitous computings in general. And it's kind of obvious that uh, location is a pretty sensitive um, you know, data to be collecting. Um, so our applications will kind of focus on uh, location uh, based, but Ansile uh, can work with any uh, OAuth2 protected data source. <clears throat> before users can, uh, before anyone can use an Ansile uh, application, users must first register and create an Ansile account. Uh, once they've registered, uh, we have a dashboard, which I'll show you um, what that looks like in a second. Uh, they can add data providers, so they can kind of hook up data uh, providers, and along with those data uh, providers, they can uh, provide policies, and I'll talk about what those look like in a minute. Um, when Ansile applications make requests, uh, any requests to the system, they must provide one or more Ansile users uh, with that request. And <clears throat> the last entity um, that I want to talk about that interacts with uh, Ansile are applications. Um, their job is to consume external data and provide some service by making requests to Ansile. In the request, uh, the application submits a program which runs inside of Ansile's trusted environment. Um, inside of that environment, Ansile um, will get <laughs> the data from the data providers and perform a computation on that data. Uh, we don't, <clears throat> we don't assume, we don't fully trust the application in, in that we don't uh, assume that uh, the program that uh, the application submits to run inside of Ansile um, is policy compliant. And so when that program is being executed inside of Ansile, it's checked in real time by Ansile's runtime monitor. Um, we do though uh, uh, kind of assume that the applications don't try to actively try to uh, find and exploit vulnerabilities uh, in the system code and that they don't try to perform denial of service attacks. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've talked about the <clears throat> entities that interact with Ansile, let's go through a life cycle of an Ansile quest, uh, request to get a better overview of what the system looks like. <clears throat> application submit request to Ansile. Um, the request contains a token that Ansile uses to authenticate the application to Ansile. Uh, so we know that what application is uh, per <clears throat> performing, uh, you know, asking for services. Um, and the request also comes with uh, one or more users that the request is for, and the program will execute 
in a trusted environment. Okay, so once, once the uh, program has been uh, submitted, <clears throat> Antio will start executing the, the program and programs start by calling uh, a command that fetches data from uh, some third party data provider. And so when that data enters into Antsile, it's immediately tagged with its corresponding policy. And the data and policy are joined together as <clears throat> a data policy pair object. This, this data policy pair is one of the key programming uh, abstractions in Antsile, and we'll see some examples of that uh, later. So once we, have <clears throat> once we have data that's entered into the system and it's been tagged with its policy, uh, Antile executes the rest of the submitted program. The only way <clears throat> to access the data is through, the, through privileged Antile commands. Uh, each of these commands are checked for policy compliance before execution. <clears throat> so Antile will run the program, and <clears throat> if uh, authorized by the policy, and if all of the commands in the program were authorized, um, any derived output, so if, if the data has been transfer, uh, transformed, uh, any derived output can be sent back to the application. And so once that data leaves the trusted environment of Ansile, we don't make any further guarantees about how that data can and will be used. <clears throat> so once it leaves, uh, kind of all bets are off. And then finally, <clears throat> when the program finishes, um, execution inside of Ansile, or is terminated um, by Ansile for a policy violation, all data associated with that request is deleted from Ansile. And so no data, no data from external data providers is stored um, inside of Ansile outside of the execution of that program. So once the program terminates, that data is no longer kept inside of Ansile. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've kind of gone over um, Given, a, given an overview of the system, uh, we can kind of dive down and look deeper at the three main components of Ansile. Uh, so the first one, we'll start with Ansile Web first, and this is the user control panel for interacting with Ansile. And so this is kind of uh, when somebody wants to register for an Ansile account and they wanna see what data providers that they have um, registered and what policies associated with them, they can do this uh, from, from this kind of web dashboard. <clears throat> In addition to uh, a user control panel, um, applications have their own contra control panel and administrators uh, have their own control panel as well. So one of the nice things uh, about uh, the Antile Web is <clears throat> we have a policy visualizer so regular expressions are a familiar tool for most programmers, um, you know, and many of them are kind of comfortable operating with regular expressions, but for some more complicated policies, it can be a bit hard to visualize. So what we've done is we've added a policy visualizer that lets users see a graphical representation of their policies, and it allows policy administrators to visualize in real time the policy as they edit. So if you're kind of modifying a policy, it brings up a little text box and you can edit it and basically um, it <clears throat> sends kind of that text box over to Ansile that will parse <clears throat> uh, the policy and then send it back so we can kind of see in real time uh, what that policy looks like. And the policy I've, I've shown here is the fully coded Ansile policy for the previous example that we looked at. <clears throat> the next component that I'd like to talk about is Ansile lib, and this is the library of privilege commands provided by Ansile. As previously stated, uh, these, ca these commands are checked for policy compliance for being, uh, before being executed uh, by an Ansile program, and these privilege commands, and <clears throat> what makes them special is, is that they have full access to the data and the policy associated with them, and that's, and that's why they're privileged. Um, we provide a general purpose library of Ansile commands, um, but applications can add their own custom commands if one of the, if they need to do something that isn't already uh, provided by our, our library. Um, and as these commands are privileged, um, 
they have to be carefully vetted before being uh, made available to the system. And so right now that process is a, is a manual process where we kind of inspect the code um, to make sure that it's, uh, that it's not doing anything um, that it shouldn't be um, before we <coughs> um, commit it to the system. There's <coughs> basically four types of commands um, in Antile lib that do slightly different functions. And I want to say a little bit about uh, kind of each of them next. Uh, so the first command <coughs> um, that <coughs> programs uh, start off with are external commands. Uh, these external commands fetch data from external sources. And so, as we saw kind of uh, when I talked about in the Ansile web part, uh, when users connect to a data source to Ansile, um, they can use kind of Ansile web to authorize access um, to their data on their behalf. We currently suppo uh, support OAuth 2, and Ansile will, will store and manage these OAuth tokens on behalf of the user. And, and this is nice. So the actual applications that make requests into Ansile, they never see these OAuth tokens. They're stored inside uh, of Ansile on, on behalf of the user for the application. So what that means is, is that <clears throat> a user needs to be able to trust Ansile, but the application, since those applications never see these um, authorization tokens, these, appl these uh, applications don't have to be trusted uh, by the user. So as long as they trust Ansile, um, they don't have to trust the applications because those applications just never see those tokens. So uh, for this example, um, get last location, um, what that will do is that will contact uh, our location st uh, storage provider. Um, we built one locally for, um, for our test beds and it will get the uh, location for the user. And as we said, um, when that data comes into Ansile, it's going to be tagged with the policy um, that you see right here. <clears throat> so the uh, next type of co command I want to talk about um, are condition, command <clears throat> condition commands. Ansile allows for conditions in policy, and we do it via these condition commands. And how these uh, commands work, they evaluate a predicate based on a data value. So for this example, I kind of highlighted in, <clears throat> in our diagram, um, the in geofence cont, that's going to evaluate uh, the location coordinates that were, were fetched from uh, get last location. And it's going to evaluate to see if those location coordinates are inside of Vassar or not. And <clears throat> what it's going to do is these condition commands it's then going to advance the policy by executing one of two internal Ansile commands. And those are shown there as underscore test false and underscore test two. And they'll execute one of those depending on the value of the evaluated predicate. So for this, for this um, policy, um, if I'm in the geofence, Text two will uh, test true will automatically get uh, executed. So those those commands aren't aren't called directly. And for this policy, I didn't need to explicitly uh, specify the underscore test false condition, um, since there's nothing that's going to be authorized if the user is outside of the geofence. Uh, but I added it just so you can kind of you can clearly see the the branching for this policy. <clears throat> So the next type of command are transformation commands. Um, and their purpose is to derive, to construct derived data and update <coughs> the, the policy. And these commands can take arguments, as you can see, um, the fuzz location, which you know, injects some noise um, into my location. That takes uh, a radius, so kind of how much noise to inject. And if an argument, um, if arguments are specified in a policy, they're going to be checked uh, by our runtime monitor. And so you can see how that's important because the fuzz location function, um, if we didn't check the, uh, if we didn't check the the parameter, like the radius that was being passed in, a program could call fuzz location with a really small radius, and you know the user's privacy. If it's you know, if the, for example, if you called it with a radius of zero, wouldn't inject any noise and which would defeat the purpose of having uh, the fuzz location 
uh, function in there. So um, if, a, if an argument is specified in a policy, <clears throat> um, anti will, will check that and we can, we can in, in addition to doing kind of just equal, um, we support all the regular uh, comparison operations like greater than, less than, uh, so on and, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, and the last, the last type of command that Antile supports are return commands, which simply send data, data back to the application. And so for our example, um, the return to app, <clears throat> that command will return our fuzzed location to the application. All right, so that, that kind of talks about uh, the different types of commands that we support in Antile uh, lib. And so the major, the last piece in the, the major module, uh, Antile is Antile Core. And this is our runtime reference monitor. And this, the Antile Core is responsible for enforcing the use restrictions um, on all of, of these privilege commands uh, on these user submitted programs. Um, in addition to being the runtime monitor, it also handles um, handling Antile requests and which we previously talked about. Um, so let's talk about kind of the structure of what an Ansile program looks like. Um, programs are submitted by the application. Um, they're written in Python. And so after Ansile very, uh, verifies the application request, it then, <clears throat> um, and as part of the request, um, it <clears throat> the request has the, the program. Um, Antile core um, will compile the program and it does that using restricted Python. And this is important because restricted Python prevents arbitrary functions and libraries from being called. Um, and so in essence, what we've done is we've restricted uh, programming so they can use kind of all the logic and syntax of Python as opposed to just writing a specific Antile language. Um, but the restricted, uh, the restricted Python, it prevents um, it restricts us to basically just running <clears throat> um, only Antile commands. And we use function decorators to make sure that these, um, function, uh, these Antile commands are checked for policy comp uh, compliance. Um, the other thing that restricted Python does is it prevents access to any restricted object fields. And so for Python, any field name that starts with an underscore, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is is restricted, and we use this uh, we use this feature on our data policy pair. Um, these data policy pairs have two fields, two restricted fields. One is the actual data, right? You can see how we want to um, hide that behind um, privileged commands, and it also has uh, the underlying policy associated with that. <clears throat> so those fields can only be accessed inside, not by the the program itself, but only when they call these uh, restricted these restricted commands. Um, which we check for policy compliance. All right, let's take a look at a, a, a program example of the um, program that we, the, the scenario that we are running example that I've described. And so down at the bottom shows our policy. And on the top, <coughs> we have our program. <coughs> so get, lo get last location. That's going to fetch my location. And again, that's one of these external commands that uh, get data source. And so that's going to return a new data policy pair, which I've assigned as data policy, DPP data policy pair one. Okay. And so now that, that's our data policy pair. And as far as the program's concerned, that's really treated as kind of an opaque object. And again, this is our data coupled with our tag policy, but in the program itself, really we can just kind of pass that around. We can't inspect the data. We can't inspect any of the policies associated with that, but we can call these Antile commands. And so <clears throat> the command uh, in geofence condition, that's a condition command. And we pass in to our arguments, we pass in our data policy pair, and we pass in an argument letting us know what um, uh, geofence is. And so this is a condition, since this is a condition command, it actually doesn't create a new data policy pair. And so in other words, um, it doesn't modify the data, it only updates the policy. 
<clears throat> depending on whether we're in the geofence or not. And as, um, as kind of a, a convenience <clears throat> uh, feature, um, these in geofence, um, these condition commands, they also return as a Boolean um, the value of their predicate. So, um, you know, we, we don't expose any of the data, but when we call these condition commands, part of the, the contract is, is that they can return the value of their predicate. So that means we can use these commands um, in like an if statement as we have here. And so if we are in fact inside the geofence, uh, we can then fuzz our location. And this fuzz location, this is a transformation command. And since it's a transformation command, it's making, it's creating a derived value. And that derived value is going to have a, a, a new data policy pair associated with it, which I've uh, assigned the variable DPP2. And so that's going to be the fuzz location and the corresponding um, updated policy for that. And you can see then the last uh, <clears throat> command is the return command, return to app. And here we're passing in data policy uh, pair two. So note, if we um, return to app, if we passed in not data policy pair two, the one that has been fuzzed, if we passed in data policy pair one, that would fail. Our runtime monitor would catch that because at that point, data policy um, pair one, well, the location hasn't been fuzzed yet, so its policy would not be authorized to return to the application because that location hadn't, hadn't been fuzzed and <clears throat> from there. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of a, a, kind of a straightforward example. <clears throat> but ANSI also supports um, authorizations that can depend on external states of another data source. So for example, let's say we have this idea of roaming office hours where a professor would like to hold office hours at scheduled times. So they posted, you know, from two to four on Tuesdays, uh, I'll be around, but um, these office hours might be held at irregular locations. And so <clears throat> you might want to have a policy um, that you will share your location. First of all, if you're on campus, so um, if you're not on campus and even though you're holding office hours, if there was an emergency or something like that, um, you don't want to share your location. So you want to share your location only if you're on ca campus and only when your calendar says you're holding office hours. Okay. Um, and that's kind of uh, demonstrated <coughs> by the diagram down at the bottom. And the program for that <coughs> is here. And so notice how we have two data sources now. Um, we have a location data source and we have a calendar uh, data source as well. So we're gonna get, we're gonna have two external commands, um, get last location as we saw before, will return us a location data policy pair. And then we also have get calendar events. And that's gonna um, be our data policy pair for calendars, okay? And so what we've done before, um, first, what we wanna do, just like in the previous example, we wanna check to make sure that we're on campus. So we're gonna use this uh, in geofence condition, just like we did before. And that will advance the policy, um, whether it's true or false. And then if we are in fact in uh, the geofence, then we can call this um, event, this, transfer, uh, this uh, event occurring condition, okay? And what's different about that, so we're passing in, we're passing in the, the <coughs> calendar data policy pair, and we're looking for the event, the calendar event that we're looking at. And, but what we've also passed in is this argument, this dependent uh, argument, which is our location data policy pair, okay? And what that means is, is that this dependent policy makes sure that it's going to check both the calendar and the location to make sure that um, both of these <coughs> policies are going to be authorized for uh, and compliant for that, okay? Um, so both of those are going to be checked to make sure that they're in policy uh, compliance. And then finally, if uh, this condition is true, then we can return the location, right? We don't have to fuzz it or anything like that um, because that wasn't <clears throat> a part of the policy from there, okay? And so if we take a look at what those policies look like, uh, the policy for the calendar is shown uh, on the left and it's a very simple policy. So 
we allow it to get the current events, and we're only going to authorize um, <clears throat> if we have this, uh, uh, this occurring condition and we match our office hours, okay? And we also show that the dependent data source is our location services, CDS is our uh, campus uh, location service um, <clears throat> uh, service from there. And on the right, we have our policy for uh, our location. And again, we have our test to see if we're in the geofence and if we're true, uh, then we'll call this a current, um, this dependent um, condition. And if that is in fact true, then we'll return to app. Otherwise, we're not gonna authorize the application to return uh, anything. <clears throat> Another feature that Ansile supports are aggregate transformations. So these are commands that take multiple data policy pairs as arguments. Um, we call these uh, transformation aggregations um, because they take multiple arguments and they return a single data policy pair with a new policy associated with it. This new policy is synthesized uh, as, the inter as the intersection as the derivative of the individual um, data policy, input data policy pairs. And so in the diagram to the right, which I'll go over in uh, more detail in the next slide, the evaluate quorum transformation is an aggregation. It's taking data policy pairs uh, from several users. <clears throat> so to show off um, our aggregation uh, feature, and to show support for aggregation transformations, we created a group study uh, Slack bot. So this is a Slack application and you can basically create a, a study channel and um, this is gonna help us uh, have facilitate meetings from with small groups of people by enabling impromptu face-to-face -face meetings. So um, we have a Slack bot, you can create a channel, you can sign up, um, I mean, the Slack bot interfaces with Ansile so you can, uh, you can basically authorize to share your location. And what the Slack bot does is, is it periodically checks um, your location and it sees whether a quorum of the group is on site on a specified geofence, say like the library. And so if you're all meeting at the library, then it simply messages the group uh, on their Slack channel that, hey, everyone is here. You should maybe, you know, if you wanna have a meeting, go, you know, you're allowed to. But it doesn't share doesn't share any of the individual uh, user locations. <clears throat> and so here's the associate, so kind of the, <laughs> it's a busy slide, but um, there's kind of the pipeline diagram, um, the particular policy, uh, which again is, um, so all the users would have the, the same policy, or could have, they get a difference, but um, for this example, all the users ha have the same policy, which is, uh, allow to fetch location and then compute the geofence on that location. <clears throat> and so notice here this, in this case, right, the previous example um, was using the condition command um, to return a condition whether you're the geofence or not. But in this case, um, we don't want the condition, we actually want the Boolean whether we're in a geofence or not, because what we're gonna need, to, what we're gonna need is we're gonna have an aggregation function, this evaluate quorum, which is gonna take input from all of the users, all of the users whether they're in the geofence or not, and then compute whether there's a quorum, whether everyone is there. And so for this program example, I've set the threshold percentage to 100, which means everyone needs to be in the group for us to get notified. And so if we look at the program, so we have three users, uh, users A, B, and C here for this, and we're creating the three data policy pairs, uh, A, B, and C for that, and we're gonna compute the geofence for those individually. And so here, this is an actual transformation function. It's not a condition um, command, it's a transformation. So um, it's taking the respective data uh, policy pairs um, as an input, um, and it's returning a new geofenced data policy pair, right? So this you know, the data, this derived data on here is just gonna be a Boolean, whether you're in the geofence or not, um, and the, the, cor the correspondingly advanced uh, policy with that, okay? And so the evaluate uh, quorum, our aggregation, this now takes a list of data policy pairs and uh, the threshold per percentage, uh, percentage. And again, again, this is also a transformation, so it's gonna return a new <coughs> data policy pair um, which is just whether this is, whether there's a quorum present, so no longer 
that data policy pair no longer has uh, individual booleans, whether who's there or not. It's simply the aggregation of all of those. Um, and then what is actually returned to the app is just simply whether everyone is there or not from there. Okay, so no user's location is, is leaked um, to Slack. It all stays uh, inside of Ansile. <clears throat> the last uh, feature uh, in Ansile that I'd like to talk about uh, is Ansile support for collections. Uh, so collections are a class that stores multiple data, uh, data values. And what's different from the aggravation, each of these individual, uh, we keep each of the individual uh, policies intact, right? As we saw from the last example, the aggregation function, it returns a new data policy pair um, that moves the, that has its own associated policy with it. And it kind of loses the history. So collections allow us <clears throat> to keep the individual, um, uh, individual policies intact. Okay, so even though the, we have the individual policies, the policy on the collection, the policies, the collections do have policies, and they're generated, they're synthesized as an intersection of the policies associated with the data values on the collection. Okay, so this allows us to support, easily support transformations on collections such as map, reduce, filter. Um, so for example, to show off collections, uh, we built a machine learning location um, predictor, which basically takes a history of user locations and then um, predicts, right? This would be good for uh, intelligent spaces where you can build models of, of when we should, you know, turn down the, the heating or turn off the lights um, and things like that. And so for this example, um, the location values were stored as a collection and storing them as a collection made it easy to filter um, out all the location data from uh, non-smartphone location uh, sources from there. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of uh, the tour of the main uh, features of Ansile and we kind of looked at some examples. And so, you know, we built these kind of prototype uh, applications and then we took a look and tried to, you know, characterize uh, Ansile's performance. And it turns out, right, so, and it, you know, a request actually has a lot of components <clears throat> and these requests can, can vary greatly. It can vary based on the length of the execution. Um, so how many commands, like for example, the ML program, right, training up an ML model, um, that, <clears throat> that command takes certainly a lot longer um, than calculating a geofence, right? So the latency of these requests vary depending on the, uh, what commands we're executing in the program and the latency of the data providers. Um, <clears throat> some of them, particularly uh, when we're calculating ca calendar, there's a lot of variance uh, from them. And so in a sense, right, we don't really have a lot of control over that, right? Um, so what we did was for performance, we focused on the uh, performance of policy evaluation. And you know, not surprisingly, um, how long it took to evaluate the policy um, depended on the complexity of, of the policy, but for all of the, our prototype applications, uh, evaluation took between one and 15 microseconds. Um, so not a substantial amount uh, of overhead uh, from there. The other thing we looked at is the overhead for compiling a program, right? So when a request comes in, um, the first thing that we do is we take that program, which is just, you know, uh, a source Python uh, program, and we need to compile that. We need to compile that under restricted uh, Python and uh, fetch any associated user credentials. And so, as you imagine, that takes a little bit uh, more time. <clears throat> For our example programs, that took anywhere between 30 and 90 milliseconds. And <clears throat> we, we saw that, that that could be a, a bottleneck. So what we did was we implemented caching uh, in our system. And so the first time a request comes in, <clears throat> Right, we have to compile the program. Um, there's no getting around that, but we'll cache that compiled program around for a while. And so if that request comes in again with the same program and the same user, so think about our Slack bot, right? It's, it's pulling, you know, every like minute or so, it's sending the same program with the same uh, users. So we cache that, we cache the program, we cache the, these requests, and that reduced the uh, overhead by an order of magnitude, right? It went from about 30 to 90, about to down to three to nine uh, milliseconds. So, that I think was, you know, a good win there. And so <clears throat> we developed this system, kind of, we give it, you know, and, and we're really looking for customers now. Um, and so if you're, you know, if you're interested in kind of thinking about how you could use something like Ansile uh, in your work, please 
um, let me know. Um, and two areas where I think, you know, Antile, I think could really kind of, you know, work very nicely is with, uh, you know, IRB compliance, right? So we, you know, we have to go through all of these <laughs> steps to make sure that we're treating data um, under these restrictions. It'd be nice to actually say, yeah, we've built these policies, these IRB compliant policies, and we run our, you know, our pipeline, our, our processing through Antile. We can guarantee, you know, with audit trails and logs to kind of prove that, um, that we are in fact in, in IRB compliance, right? And, and, and I would argue that, um, you know, knowing that there's strong safeguards in place, I, I would think users would be more willing to participate with that. And I think another area where I think, you know, anti will fit very nicely is enterprise, um, you know, and internal data privacy compil com uh, compliance. We're hearing that, you know, uh, Facebook and, and Amazon, you know, are kind of coming up with their own internal IRBs to enforce their internal privacy guidelines. And so here, you know, you'd be protecting not necessarily against someone malicious, but just making sure that they, you know, don't have a bug or somehow or don't know the rules and somehow miss um, using that data. <clears throat> so to kind of wrap up, um, we talked about some privacy challenges that arise in ubiquitous computing. Um, hopefully I've demonstrated that use-based privacy can be leveraged in, in particular location-based ubiquitous computing applications and hopefully ubiquitous computing applications in, in general. And we've shown that Antile can, can kind of meet these privacy needs um, with this runtime monitor and the overhead isn't too bad. So with that, I will stop and take your questions. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna just throw up some slides real quick here, just to go over some news that's impacting uh, our trusted CI community. And uh, we'll let some questions pile up and then we'll go through them together. Okay, so uh, first, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat box by clicking on the little chat icon. And um, also, we have a survey that we would like you guys to fill out. Let me just put this in the chat so that it's a hyperlink that you can actually click on. Here we go. So uh, if you would like to give us some feedback about this presentation, or if you'd like to suggest topics or presenters, uh, go ahead and fill out our survey and fill in the comments section with the suggested presentations. And then next up, uh, we have a reminder, uh, Trusted CI has a number of things that we're doing at PERC, which is next week, so it's really coming up on us. We've got a workshop, we've got a panel, we're presenting our technical paper, we've got a booth. So if you're coming to PERC, uh, please come and find us. Registration for PERC is closed because they hit their maximum, which is very exciting. Um, so if you are attending, come and find us, say hi. Uh, also, our Cybersecurity Summit, uh, the uh, Trusted CI Cybersecurity Summit is October 15th through 17th in San Diego. The registration form is open. The call for presentations, participation is open. So please check us out at trustedci.org slash summit and uh, apply or uh, uh, register to attend or uh, present a topic. And then just a little bit more about our Trusted CI webinar series. To view presentations, to join the announcements mailing list, submit requests, visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is August 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, the topic is the scientific workflow integrity with Pegasus, also known as SWIP. And our presenters are Anirban Mandal and his colleagues. So with that, Let's go through a question here. We've got, have you, uh, Jason, have you explored any examples using healthcare oriented apps like step monitor or heart rate monitor? Yeah, that's exactly, you know, an area where I think Antile can fit, you know, really, really well. Um, so <clears throat> there's another project going on inside of Cornell Tech um, that uses Google Takeout. So um, for retrospective learning, uh, this project's called Riddle. And there, basically, the idea here is, is that you kind of sync up um, Google Takeout, and it dumps a bunch of your data, and they can do some retrospective learning to, to get some kind of greater population-sized insights uh, about health and well-being, about depression, about uh, a whole bunch of different areas. And so right now, there's actually a study going on 
um, using that data, and they're actually doing a, a, a formal study about that. They're not using AntSile right now, but this would be a perfect use case. And so the next thing um, that I, uh, we're exploring is is that what would what would a AntSiled version of this study look like? Are, is our policy language flexible enough to support that? Uh, and we can, you know, can we do that? Um, but the whole area of step monitoring and health monitoring is, is definitely, I think, a very good fit for AntSiled. And, and we really want to move in that direction. Uh, we've got another question here. How much flexibility does the data owner have for setting data access policies via Ansile Web. It appears the program that runs in Ansile Core needs to be aware of each policy condition. So policy changes would require changes to the program in Ansile Core. Yeah, so there's, <clears throat> there's definitely a relationship between the program um, and, and the policy, right? Um, you can't necessarily write an effective um, program without having some understanding of, of the policy. Um, there's a couple of ways I think we can go about that. So right now, kind of our model is, is that end users aren't necessarily going to be setting the policy. Um, the, the, the envision, um, though we give them the flexibility to do that, um, but right now kind of our model is, is, is that we have kind of policy administrators. So you think of this as someone you know, a PI on a project, someone who is, you know, maintaining the IRB. And so in that case, right, if you have kind of IRB sort of things, you, you probably only support um, one policy that the user can really either, if you're going to participate in the study, here is the policy. Um, or we anticipate, um, you know, giving the users a, a small number of choices. Um, like here are kind of, you know, a couple of different you know, choices, not kind of an infinite uh, number of that. Uh, but what we do, though, is <clears throat> applications through a request into, in, into Ansile, they can get the specific privacy policy associated. So you could dynamically look at what that policy is and construct your program around that. Uh, the person responded, thanks. So we've got, a th we've got three questions up here. So I will do the, I'll just run through them and then uh, let you answer after each question, after I read each question. So question one, uh, who are your customers, app developers, or end users of the apps, like applications? Sure, and in some ways, I, I kind of think both. Um, you know, so in some sense, um, you know, we want to make Ansile attractive such that application developers would want to use our system, um, right? Because in some sense, you know, I like to think of Ansile as helping applications do the right thing um, because you could, you know, you, there's either it, so I think there's a couple of places. So one, you could kind of work in a semi-closed environment. So kind of, you know, that's what I'm thinking kind of like a campus planning, enterprise planning where um, you say, oh, here, here's this application. Um, you know, we're going to use this. Um, it's going to monitor your location, but we put these safeguards in place to do um, this, you know, we're only going to use it in these very specific enterprise specific manner. Um, so in some sense, right, we're trying to create a, um, a robust environment that application developers would want to use Ansile and, but, you know, uh, end users too, um, we want to make sure that they feel empowered to use these applications and that they have some faith and trust, um, that, uh, these applications are doing what they say they're doing. Okay, next question. Let's say an app's intention of collecting location data is not bad. So they would simply apply those filters to insert noise in the location data. Why would they enroll something like Ansile? In other words, if the app developers wants to, want to know the exact location, why would they agree to use Ansile? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, uh... I think I missed some of that, but I, I can see the chat. Um, so let's say, so, so an app is, okay, so the app is, we're assuming that the app is trusted in this case. Um, and, and so I guess the question, ah, so I think the question gets to where is that computation being done, right? So if, if we trust the application, then I don't know that the overhead of, you know, moving the computation inside of Ansile 
um, is, is, is worth it when we can simply get the location data directly um, from there. So I don't think, it, you know, I, I think if you trust the app, and I think that's a big if, um, I think that, you know, doesn't, you know, it, 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 does, it mitigates the, the need to use Antile, but that's, I think that's a big if. And then the third question, can you briefly explain the workflow and data flow if I want to use Ansel on my phone? Sure. And I think uh, probably the best way to do is, is um, kind of thinking about that kind of workflow I did through the, uh, um, at the beginning. So um, Antile is a web service. So all of these requests come in through HTTPS. Um, and so if your application uh, wants to request some data from Ansile, um, it would just make the HTTP request um, with the program that would execute inside Ansile. The users, um, you know, associated with that, uh, uh, um, you know, with that request, and then what comes back, a response comes back. Um, and I didn't get into that; it's just too too many details. But uh, the response that comes back is is an HTTP, uh, uh, you know, is a is a is a response. Uh, that has the data uh, associated with it. Um, if there was any errors, right, if the, the request had failed, it gives you um, some errors for debugging information. So um, a mobile phone app just, just needs to make an HTTP request. Okay. Uh, let's see if uh, we get any replies to that uh, series of questions. Uh, why don't we start uh, doing our last call for questions because we're kind of coming up on the uh, top of the hour. Oh, here's the reply. So both the users as well as the app developers have to register with Ansile. That's, that's correct, right? Okay. So uh, I didn't show the, the app interface, um, the web interface to Ansile, but they register their app and they, they, get, a, uh, you know, they get a secret token to verify um, that the app is who they say it is. And then users, again, go through that process. Um, and so, uh, and so applications um, deal strictly with Antile users. Okay, so uh, great. Thanks for the answers, they say. All right, so with that, um, just a last quick call for questions, if we have any or comments. Um, and Jason, I want to thank you very much for presenting today. Uh, do you have any final comments? before we wrap uh, no. things up? Uh, no, thank you. This has been great. It was my pleasure to be here. We're happy to have you. Um, the person commenting says the policy visualizer is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Good job. And personally, I have to say, I really like your icon, uh, your <laughs> logo. It's really nice. <laughs> Very thank <smart>. you. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, everyone, I think we'll stop recording. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Great. Thank you.